wood as a medium for your work. Yes. Well, that was the Second World War. And what happened was uh, you couldn't buy uh, bronze and all the expensive materials. What's more, because of the war, and what's more, who could afford it if you could mm -hmm. buy some? And then uh, my kind of mind likes instantaneous, likes to relate immediately with what it's doing. And I think that uh, it, for example, I think the work really kind of forced itself on me. I had made the decision then. I said, now look, I can't afford this. There is a ward. You can't get material. What do you want to do? Uh, maybe it's futile to work at all. There may be uh, danger in wherever you are. And I thought, well, I think the most important thing to living is to do it, no matter if a plane comes and destroys it or whatever, but you must go on working. And so, uh, there are things happened to me. I saw, for instance, in my studio outside, I, I've described it in the book, by the way, there was a box. It must have contained once a rolled up rug, because it was very narrow. It was about six or eight in six inches, I think, uh, wide. It must have been eight feet long, and it was about, well, so six feet tall. So it must have been a rug. And I looked at it, and I thought, well, this is gorgeous. Well, I took it before I could think too much. I brought it in the studio and began working with it. Then I began working. So it was almost a natural, like it imposed itself on me, and I imposed myself on that. So it was, it was a natural. Is there anything in your background that really made it obvious that you would go to wood as a medium? No one knows that my father was in lumber and builder and, and actually he was very capable. But I didn't think so at the time. Now consciously, no. As a matter of fact, if I was conscious, I probably wouldn't have done it. <laughs> Louise, the critics have always admired your work, but for quite some time, a very, very long time, it seemed that the public did not quite think that your found object wood sculptures were either aesthetically or monetarily valuable. Almost of scale models for a small city. Is there a grand design? Was there from the very beginning? As I always claim that there's some of us come ready-made. You know, really, if you look into many lives that uh, have known they were, say, musical, or that they were visual, or what they were. And, uh, you see, I don't think I allow too much for chance of different things, because I knew I, what I was going to do from childhood, and I've never varied. I never, sometimes I think that I must have been stupid, because I was like a horse with blinders. I only knew one way to go. In the most recent period, you finished three monumental and I guess dreamlike assignments for any creative person. And I'm thinking specifically of, to begin with, your complex design of all the sculpture, the architectural ornament, and even the vestment for St. Peter's Church. Then I'm thinking of Louise Nevelson Plaza a park bounded by, and quite appropriately, by Maiden Lane and Liberty, where there are seven monumental metal sculptures. And then I'm thinking of a wall 17 feet by 35 feet that has recently been installed at the World Trade Center. Well, when you ask me about the flags, well, you see the buildings are so tall and the buildings are triangular, you know, as they go up. Consequently, uh, th these flags were designed so that they would not be on the ground, but they looked as if they were flying, you see. And uh, really... You referred to yourself as a primitive artist when you created them. What did you mean by that? Well, what I meant was that today 
you can make a small either maquette or a drawing things and send it to the foundry and uh, that can be made up at, at all any dimension but I feel as I said to you that uh, well I still go to the foundry and work with the men and create while I'm there I've done it now since the foundry is in existence and uh, the same people so I work with. So you are with. there during the fabrication of your piece. Does the piece evolve while you're there? Yes. Rather than just doing a drawing or a maquette and sending it off and waiting for the finished work? Well, I've chosen to go there with the men and do it piece by piece. Also, technology comes into it. Science comes into it. Now, suppose I want a piece uh, that is a ton for one piece. I will say to the boys, uh, these are the boys at the foundry. At the foundry. I'll say, uh, I want this piece. Now, they have the mechanics that they pick that up as if it was a piece of paper and lay it down as I wish. So well, does your work evolve while you're there? Yes. yes. Do you ever change it while it is being created? Sometimes. Not too often at this point in my life, but there are times that as they evolve, you begin to see there may be a piece. I try to avoid it, but if it is not what I want, then we do take it off. You see, my dear, that we call that spot welding. Spot welding. Now, it isn't that much of a problem. It is a problem, but not that much to take it down in that first stage. And I do think for myself, that for what, for my time and what I understand, I prefer to do it that way. There's some, it's very satisfying to me. You mentioned there were thousands of workers in those office buildings. Obviously, mm -hmm. those thousands of workers are all at different levels as well. Mm -hmm. That's why I call them flags, because they are, well, I don't quite remember the different, um, feet from the sidewalk or from the mm -hmm. plaza itself right. mm -hmm. uh, for that very reason uh, so that they can float in when you look out of different windows you can see them and did you determine that from going to any of those buildings i determined that by going to some of the buildings yes also what i think was kind of wonderful is when i was doing them in the foundry uh, we had land enough and we measured it off and everything was done and placed just as if we were doing it downtown permanently. But what